So here are a list of questions or statements that need to be defended in the terms of Judaism. All wars have come because of religion. That's a very well-known and common statement. So how do you respond to that? How can religious Jews be evil? How come that there are stories where religious Jews have done bad things? How can that be? I just don't get it. Question number two. Question number three is, how do I deal with people I don't like? I was asked this this week. What do I do with people I do not like? How do I deal with them? Why should I listen to the rabbis? I don't like organized religion. This is a uh, question that I was asked a few weeks ago. And it's not really a question. It's just like these statements, you know, like, hey, I think you should really be involved. Actually, it's amazing. No, I hate the rabbis or I don't like organized religion. I'm sure you've heard these statements before, or maybe you've even come through stages where you made these statements yourselves. I don't think you're doing that anymore. Okay, so that's a question that I've had. Um, what else? Oh, someone asked me about, is it okay to have a dual loyalty, both to the Jewish people, Israel, and to America? Is that bad? Is that good? Is it okay to have a dual loyalty? I wonder what you think. How do you remove anxiety? I have been having a lot of anxiety recently. Rabbi, can you tell me how do I move it away from me? How do I remove it? So that was a good question. Uh, how does one grow in Judaism in a healthy way? It's too demanding. I feel like it's asking from me too much. I can't do this. So how do I grow Jewishly in a healthy way? That's a question I've been asked many times and also very recently. Someone was meeting me this week and telling me that he finds himself very jealous of everybody. Whenever he sees success in other people, it bothers him. Whenever I see good in others, I good downplay others. it. If I see good in the world, I downplay the good. Um, I'm jealous of people that date. I'm jealous of people that have families that do well. So what, what can I do to overcome that serious feeling of jealousy on everybody else. What do I do? I just have this in me all the time and I just can't connect to my Jewish roots because of this one thing that's always bothering me. So that's uh, another question I was asked this week. Am I meant to tip, what's it called, the waiter in the restaurant if I've been charged way too much? So if I've been overcharged, is it okay to uh, avoid the tip? That was a question that I've been asked as well. Okay, let me just go through them. So the statement that all wars are from religion. By the way, first of all, you have to know, you don't always have to respond to someone's question no, or someone's statement. So even though all these statements are a list here of many questions that people have asked me and statements that people have said, I don't always need to suppress his expressions suppress his way of thinking because if I do that way he for sure will reject me either way uh, there are times where you have to respond for instance if he says or she says a statement to you in public at least me as a rabbi I value certain truths and if that statement is said in public to me then I do and I am demanded to kind of give a good response so that is true but even so most times people are not asking logic they're asking also emotion. There's two places where a question comes from. One is from logic and one is from emotion. These are two different questions. For instance, um, just, just, just a thought here, okay? When somebody says to me, Rabbi, I, I, I don't think there's a creator of the universe. I think this universe randomly came to be. Can you explain to me why you think there's a God? Logically, it should be the other way around. He needs to explain to me why there is no God. Not that I need to explain to him that there is a God. Logic is on my side in terms of whether God created the universe or not. Whether this, because order demands order. When I see a, when I throw ink on a paper, even if I had infinity chances, right? And you told me that, I had an infinite amount of chances. There is no possibility that I had an infinite amount of chances because 
Past, present, and future means I'm bound to time and, and, and re physical reality. So that means I can't be in, I'm in a finite reality p currently. So it can't be that I, I have infinite, the word infinite's thrown way too often. I don't have infinite possibilities. So if I take a paper and I throw ink on it, what are the odds that that paper's now gonna draw me a beautiful painting? Forget Mona Lisa, but just a nice beautiful ship and the ocean. And, and a world, what are the odds that that painting is going to come out just by me throwing ink? How many times will I have to throw ink randomly on a paper to form a beautiful picture? I mean, it's absurd to think that something which is so organized can create, uh, through can be created through chaos. No one would ever say that a table just came together to itself to be by itself. It must be that this table was formed through, not just by wind and some kind of the sun and the world and suddenly the table just screwed together and came a table. When I see something which is organized, it tells me that something organized made it. And the more complex the thing is, the more complex it is, the more it screams a creator. When I see a, lap, when I see a table, I don't say it just came from nowhere. Definitely when I see a laptop, I don't say it came from nowhere. You see the, the, a phone which is able to um, do so many things. It's, it's composed... You know, it's got so many wires and connections in it. Of course, it never came from by itself. So logic is actually on the uh, is on my side in terms of whether God created the universe or not, not the other way around. Okay, because order demands a creator, not the other way around. So the re the true response is the true response isn't always about bashing and winning. The other side, we, we kind of do that a lot, especially with young people that are idealists and we're on, you know, when people are on campus, we have to, th we have to win have, and we get agitated and people are like, you know, when, but as you get older, you realize, hey, I don't have to win every argument. It's not about winning. So that's an important aspect also is that you don't have to always win an argument. Another point is that the only way to actually um, have a good sense of communication if they see that you are a kind person. It says, Olam chesedi bane, the world was created through kindness. Abraham was a man of kindness and the way that he connected to people, especially in terms of showing them that, that his belief is something which is really important, the way that he did it was through chesed. He invited people to his home. The way to connect to someone is to open their heart, to, to show that you care. To show that you're a good person. And then, only afterwards, can you actually have a word that would actually be listened to. Especially when you're talking to somebody who thinks completely different to you. So the way to actually communicate is through chesed at first. Is to touch their emotion through kindness. Through showing that you care. Through compassion. And then, will your words actually have weight and go through to the other side. So many times it's very difficult to actually win. And you shouldn't only feel like you have to win every conversation but at least these answers should be for myself okay and when somebody says the statement is religion um uh, uh, the cause of all wars that's wrong it's absolutely wrong if you just look i i think the lack of religion is the cause of wars not the act of religion yes religion says by the way we have to define what war is religion says that if somebody comes to kill you you should jump up and kill him first. Meaning, Habat, we are not a passive religion. We don't believe that people can just come freely and hurt us. We do have the right to defend ourselves, and that's a good moral belief in Judaism. It says, don't murder, not don't kill. Because murder is an act of senseless uh, killing, and, and not killing, it doesn't say don't kill, because you can kill in certain circumstances. For instance, to save a life, to save many lives. Okay, so that you can do if they're coming to kill you. So that's, that's obvious. Okay, so when you say the word war, that in itself needs definition. And the second thing is, is it true? Or is it the lack of religion that caused? Just look at this. Just in the last century, 20th century alone, 108 million people were killed in war. Okay, 108 million people. Who by? Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Soviet Union in 
was part of its institution was removing anything to do with religion. That was it. There was no religion at all. They, they wanted socialism where everyone had their own belief and they actually taught atheistic beliefs in schools. They wanted their own system. They didn't want a system on top of their system. Okay, so socialism was the opposite of religion. And some people claim, well, Hitler was religious. No, he wasn't. His, his mother was, but his father wasn't, and Hitler opposed all the views of religion, laughed at it, scorned at it. He said um, that the law of selection, right, the survival of the fittest, is completely against the idea of religion. And he, of course, he hated religion. Look how many Jews he killed. So it was the lack of religion that caused, and by the way, in the past century, it's almost as many people, we don't know exactly how many people were killed previously, but they, they estimate 150 million people were killed in all of history before the 20th century. 20th century alone, 108 million people killed. Why? Because our warfare was more advanced and the ability to kill great numbers grew in ways that we never had beforehand. But 108 million in one century alone, and it was all by the lack of religion. So how could you tell me that religion is the cause of all wars? Okay, so that's the answer to one, the first question. The second question is, that many people ask me is, how can religious Jews be evil or do wrong? So, first of all, who says he's religious? Who says we, we, we think that if you're wearing a keeper and you have a beard, you are for sure religious. Who says? Could be he was born that way, but it doesn't mean he's religious inside. We all dress in certain ways, but we're not always standing up for that value from within inside. It doesn't mean anything. It does mean something. It means a, it, there is a statement for sure that he tries to go in that path, but it doesn't mean that that person is religious. I find that there could be. You could get people that are in the religious community who are overly materialistic, and they're definitely not going too much in the values of Judaism. There's, you can have people that steal and they look religious. So just because you um, look the part doesn't necessarily mean you are from within. That's just the externals. All this is just external. It helps me, definitely helps me. You see, when I walk in a bar or something, I have to act a bit nicer because everyone's looking at me like this. Oh, you know, there's a Jew over there. So it definitely helps me be better. It helps me act better in public. But no way does it mean that I am now religious just because I put this on. That's absurd. When, when, when you put on police clothes, when a policeman puts on clothing or a nurse, a doctor, puts on the clothing of a doctor, that affects the person. With, as soon as he does that, suddenly I feel different. I feel the importance. So the impact of my external way of dressing definitely influences me on the inside. There's no question about it that my keeper has an influence on me on the inside, but only if I'm conscious of it. If I'm not conscious of it, it's an external factor. We are so judgmental of how people look on the outside and we don't really look at the... So when, when that person asks me, how can a religious pe person do something wrong? First of all, who says he's religious? Maybe he's not even religious. Just because he looks good on the outside or religious on the outside doesn't mean he is. So that's the first point. And the second point I would say is, so let's say a religious Jew is caught stealing or money laundering, okay? I don't understand. The Torah says clearly, do not steal, okay? Lot ignov, don't, don't steal. So the Torah says, don't steal. Okay? And, and a, a man or a woman that looks religious was caught stealing. Are they following the Torah or not following the Torah? Are they... Being religious in that aspect or not, they're not. So what's, where's the problem? In the Torah or in the person? Who's at fault here? The Torah or the person? When you see a religious person that's doing something he shouldn't be, who's at fault? For instance, you see a religious person smoking. And it's very easy to judge because our culture in America is completely against smoking. But if you go to Israel, it's like very much part of the culture. Not good at all. So if you see a religious person in Israel smoking, you'll be like, this doesn't make sense. He's religious, but then he's smoking. Well, what's going on here? And it's true. The Torah says, You should guard your, your body. You have to look after your body. 
So how, how can it be? It doesn't make sense. Who's at fault here? The, the person that's doing it or the Torah? We kind of confuse the two many times. We say, ah, oh, see, the religious person is doing it. There's a fault in the Torah. Who says the, t- the Torah says clearly don't do it. So the fault is in the person that does it. Okay, so that's the second thing. Um, the third answer that I, I always say is, the fact that you're asking this question proves that religious people are held to a higher standard. Meaning, when, when somebody steals that's not religious, it will never hit the news. That will never be something you know, to talk about. Why did he steal? Because he's a thief. Why, why did he steal? Because he's a thief. No one would say, it wouldn't be something that's out of the blue. Like, oh my gosh, a, a, religious, a religious guy stole. It's because he's not religious. So no one even thought, talks about it. The fact that it happens and it gets labeled out proves that we hold that person to a higher standard. For instance, if a judge was caught stealing, we'll also find it very strange. He's the person that's sitting in court all day and, and talking about being lawful. And, and convicting people for not acting lawfully, and then he's not living a lawful life himself, doesn't make sense. So if we catch a judge that would be caught stealing, or money laundering or whatever, that is very strange to us because he should be living to higher standards that he claims to be holding by. So that is the problem. But, but at the end of the day, what does it tell me? That religion is living in a higher standard because the fact that you ask that question proves that Judaism is living on a higher standard and the truth is it is you go to a religious school and I've been to both worlds because we lived in 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 in, in England and and in Israel in places where there's only a very religious community and we've been in public schools teaching and working with kids from public schools, not Jewish as well. Me and Shira went to public schools in Oregon. That's what we used to do. We used to go into public schools and not college, besides for college, actual public schools, high schools. And we would run events. It was mainly um, uh, Shira's act and work. I was more on the... I was, I mean, we both worked on college campus, but Shira also used to go on to um, high schools and do programs there for high school kids. And it was unbelievable. And we used to see stuff that was happening in those schools that we would never see in our school. It, it, the way that they would talk, the way they would speak was inappropriate in, in ways that we would never speak. So, you know, it, yes, we are held to a higher standard, that's for sure. But that, that's a good sign. Right? So the fact that this question even comes around is a sign that the religious community is held to a higher standard. And the final point I want to make is that just because I'm a religious Jew, it means I don't have desires. Just because I'm a religious Jew, I don't make mistakes. We're all flawless. Just because I'm growing Jewishly and I and I like the values that Judaism teaches, does that mean I don't have emotions and, and desires within me? Of course I do. Every single human being has desires. What do you think I am? Not human? We are all human and we have desires. We fall short in those desires sometimes. And it says, Sheva yipol tzadik v'kam. The righteous person falls as well. Seven times he'll fall, but the thing is he'll keep getting up. He'll never give up. That's what makes a righteous person. The fact that he keeps getting up. But we know in Judaism, you will fall. That's normal. So it's easy for us to judge somebody else who's falling. I'll give you an example how easy it is. Okay? If you, if you go into, if you come out, if you go in the kitchen and you take out a bottle of milk and you drop it and the milk spills everywhere, would you be like, would you be mad with yourself? Like, how did I do this? What an idiot. Why did I throw my milk on the floor? Would you get mad with yourself? How many people here will go mad with themselves if they drop milk on the floor? You'd go crazy with yourself? How crazy would you go? Not so crazy. Do you know what you'll do? A little bit. Do you know what you'll do? After a short while of drinking, of dropping the milk, do you know what you'll do? You'll say, you know what? I'm human. It's normal. People do drop milk. That will come to your mind at some point, right? Make sense? At some point you'll say, I'm normal. I'm human. I drop milk. Well, I'll tell you something. If it was your child or your spouse, it might be very different. You have to work on it, but it might be very different. Or if it was your friend, your roommate, you'll be like, why on earth did you drop the milk? 
Why, why did he do that? Oh, they, they can't make, they have to be perfect and you can make mistakes. We are very good at, at letting ourselves free and saying we're not that bad. I'm very bad at saying that with everybody else. So that's, that's just the point to throw in is that humans do make mistakes. That's, that's a normal condition of humanity. Okay, so that's my answer to how can religious people do things that are wrong sometimes. One, maybe he's not religious. Number two, the problem is not him. It's the, to- the problem is him, not the Torah. Number three, um, it proves that religion is held to a higher standard. And number four, humans are normal and they do fall to their desires. Okay? Next question. Hey, Jonathan, how you doing? So here's the next question. How do I deal with people that I don't like? Okay, so there's people that you don't like in your life that are rude, uh, obnoxious. You could say that they are people that you don't want in your life. And this is a question I've been asked. So how do I deal with people I don't like? What do you do? So here's the answer. You don't want to be a not nice guy. You've got to be a nice guy. But you're dealing with someone you don't like. So how do you deal with that? So here's, here's my rule of life, okay? And I do this because I'm a religious dude and I'm a rabbi. And what I do is literally what me and Shira does is gra- we, we, we draw in people that, and we try and build a community. Who do you think are the people that are most likely to be gravitated to our community? We d- in Oregon as well, we had the shul and we had a, a, a... Which type of people do you think are most likely to be gravitated first? Do you, know, you want to know? I'll be very honest. It's normally people that are not the healthiest. They feel like, oh, the rabbi can be my psychologist. He can be my therapist. And a lot of times we've had that in the synagogue especially, is that the people that gravitated the most right at the beginning, as soon as we opened, calling us constantly, are people that had a lot of issues, right? Not always, but there have been situations where that happened. And it's, it's common. It's a common problem in many of the communities. And it's kind of hard to push them away because you want the healthy people to keep coming back, like all the people in this group. And you don't want the unhealthy people to keep coming back. It's, un, it's, not, it's not good because they push away everybody else. So what do we do? How do you maintain an environment where healthy people are around you and the unhealthy people are not. The people that you don't really want around you. And you've got to be nice. You can't be like, hey, you don't feel cool to me. So get out of here. You're cool. Come into my house. You can't do that. So I first want to say, the first thing, there's a difference between somebody you don't like, right? And somebody that's harmful. Today in our culture, we have to have everybody that we like in our circle. Okay? It's... That's, that's not what I'm talking about because there's some people that are not cool that could be the most beneficial people to you in your life. They're the most insightful. They may not look and they may not have a huge influence on Facebook, but they are actually good people. I bet you, if you close your eyes, the, you can easily think of five people that are not, are not well known in your community, are not outgoing, and they're the nicest people that you like the most. I bet you could think of five. Okay? So when I'm talking... In general, I'm not talking about people, and I made this point when the person asked me this question, there's a difference between someone you don't like and someone who's harmful. Judaism says you have to embrace everybody. Every human is created in the formation of God. But then there's people that are harmful. So that is where we are coming in, and that's exactly where we as an organization and you as people should also um, feel. So the question is, how do you push away people that you don't like? And I made the distinction between somebody you don't like and someone who's harmful. Okay, Joseph? There's someone who's harmful who you want to really push away. Someone you don't like is a different story because we are not the type of people as Jews that say, oh, they don't have 50,000 friends on Facebook. I don't want to speak to them. That's not how we work. But in general, somebody that's harmful, that is the real place where the question should be. And the answer is, one answer, it's called attention. You, if you give people attention, they will come back to you. If you don't give them the attention, they will not come back to you. Simple as that. You don't have to always push people away. But the general rule is whoever you give attention to will come back to you. Whoever you don't give attention to 
will not come back to you. This is really important because people that are harmful shouldn't be in your life. And I'm talking about harmful people that say things that are that are damaging, that say things that are rude. And it could come, and normally comes because you're very kind. And you, 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 you feel like, oh, I want to include this person. I feel bad. I want to include them in my, in my events. I want to include them in my parties. I want to include them in everything that I'm doing because I feel bad for them. No, if they are harmful to you, don't be too nice. And that means don't over give them attention. We should be nice to people and say hello and smile and be kind and, you know. But, but at the end of the day, you can't be a, a, in a place where you're too kind to somebody that you shouldn't be because they're harmful. Harmful means that they say things that are damaging that put you in harm's place where people don't want to be around you. Okay? When... Meaning, when, when I know that as soon as I call this person, he's going to bring his friend who is, who is really a bad influence. That's a harmful person. He's harming his friend. Right? Let's say you've got David and you have um, Aaron. Right? So, David and Aaron. Da Aaron is really rude, really, you know, not acting in a good way. Very harmful. Talks very bad to women. Talks bad to other people. Right? So, let's say, whenever I see David, I see him with Aaron. Aaron is harming David. Not only is he harming the people, he's not only harming himself, he's harming David. Because now, whenever, you, whenever people see David, they know that he's going to come along with this guy called Aaron. No one wants him around. So David is getting hurt. Make sense? So what we got to do in life is make sure that we give attention to those that are not harmful. And don't try and be nice, extra nice, to those that are already harmful or are uncomfortable to be around. That's not what you would want to do. And I don't think that's the right thing to do. We should distance ourselves from people that are harmful. It's the first pasuk in Tehillim. It's the first prayer in Tehillim. A person who's happy is somebody who doesn't go with people that are wicked, that do bad, that talk badly, that think badly, that speak badly to, to other people. Right? That's not someone you want to be around. So... Um, I think that that's a very important point. There's a difference between someone you don't like and someone that's harmful. Someone you don't like, if you do not like them because of their looks, well, that's ridiculous. You should still like that person. Okay, but we're talking about somebody who's harmful, who speaks badly, who ruins the environment, who's negative. How do you keep away from that person? The answer is don't give them attention. Say hello. We have a rule in Judaism. It's called kabdeu vechajdeu. Be respectful, but also be suspectful. Meaning, respect and suspect. Everybody you meet that you don't know, you should always respect them. Say hello. My name is Jack Malone. Nice to meet you. And that's it. And then you also suspect them. You don't give them over all your information about everything you do and where you live. And you don't know the person. So respect, but suspect. That's the way that we are meant to greet people in general. So... Harmful people should be removed from your life. You don't want them around you because they are harming you. And that is the general rule of thumb. Okay. The next statement I've had is, I don't like organized religion. I would never listen to the rabbis. I just don't, I don't feel, hey, do you want to get involved with, oh, before we go to the next question, does anyone have questions, thoughts, statements, ideas that you want to share with the first two points that I made so far? I'm sure Jonathan's got something to say. Sadian. And Jonathan Tobin too. Anyone? Thoughts? Should we push harmful people away? How would you do it? Would you just be like, dude, get out of my face? So, I'm sorry I missed part of it because I realized I was cooking something and I no needed problem. to eat. <laughs> um, I, did hear, I did hear part that I... Um, I really liked, which is kind of, it sounds like you're setting a boundary for yourself. You're not, you're not being rude to someone. You're not kind of going in their face and like out, like kind of calling them out for not being a good person or not being someone that's friendly or whatever, but you're setting a boundary. You're respectful for that, for them, but you don't let them kind of penetrate your own happiness or your own exactly kind of bubble, right? You have to be safe and smart and set your own boundaries so that, People can't influence you too much, right? And negative exactly. people can't influence you too much. 
I agree with you, um, Natasha. That's a great, great point. And it's to do a lot also with, I hear that from people, with friends, you know, they can feel like, oh, there is a certain friend that's really negative. They have such a negative environment or when they come in, it really brings down like everything. And you can't just be too nice and not say anything. I mean, at some point you do need to look out for your own life, your own, you know, positivity, bring yourself up. And if certain people are not the right people, then we, we need to know how to do it respectfully. But yeah, get get these people not not in our friend group or in our community. And the best way to do it is to not, like we were saying, not to openly just push them out, but to say, you know, be respectful and just not constantly open up that. Con you know, when people are being too nice. And they feel bad for the person that's like weird and is rude and wrong. So you feel bad and then you, you overly go into a conversation with them. Why are you doing that? Why are you taking yourself? Because you're trying to be too nice, you're harming yourself. You're getting into a conversation way too long because you feel bad that you didn't speak to them enough. Or you feel bad. Just don't do that. You're putting yourself in a situation where you'll find it hard to get out of afterwards. So just avoid that. Avoid that conversation. That's really where I'm getting at. I don't think people here in this group have that problem, but that was a question I was asked, and I think it's important that we do, even though Judaism is all about inclusion and love and loving people, but you've got to love yourself first, okay? And loving yourself, a big part of it is pushing away those that are harmful and rude and not including those in your space. That's not what you want. That evil exists, bad exists, and you've got to be in a place of good. And just, it's just a reality. We're not people that ignore reality. Reality is there are evil people. So you don't just include them all. And you only include those that are good. Okay. Um, the next question I was asked is, or the statement, I don't like organized religion. This has, this has happened to me so many times. But uh, again, it happened to me recently when a new guy was introduced to me. And he went on a rant going on about how he doesn't like the rabbis. He thinks, I'm, I'm a rabbi, by the way, you know, uh, I don't like the rabbis. I think they're <laughs> ridiculous. They're this, they're that. They just, and I don't like organized religion anyway. So I love the, I love when people throw these words, you know, like Judaism brainwashes. Judaism's a cult because first of all, I'm spiritual. Yeah. What do those words mean? First, we need to define what those, you're just throwing words. So normally when somebody says, I don't like organized religion, they're basically saying, I don't like doing things which are outside of logic. Or it's organized, it's part of a system, and there's no logic to it. Just everyone's following it, so everyone follows it. Who, who does that? Do you know anyone that does things that are completely out of logic, just like that? Not Judaism. That's not what we are. We actually have a depth behind everything that we do. And you can't tell me that in terms of organized, that it means that we just do things with no logic at all. Okay? Well, you don't like the rabbi. What, what's the rabbi suggesting you to do? To How to play chess? You probably don't need a rabbi for that. Or how to play, um, carry on playing games on your, on, your, on your laptop. I mean, you don't need a What is the rabbi talking about? What? Monetary values, uh, marriage, caring, loving, uh, how to grow family, how to bring in a family into your life, how to judge people right, how to be happy within yourself. Okay, these are all the values we speak about. That's it. Th those are good values. So what do we do? We, what, what, what is Judaism really trying to do? I'll tell you what it's trying to do. It's trying to enhance all those things. Okay, just like we, we love clarity and logic. Everyone likes logic, right? We, we go to school for 20 years. That's pretty organized. And you know what they teach me? How to be successful in my business. Very, and it gives me an organized structure of how to do it. That's organized. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. So you do like things that are organized because the world is organized, right? The world is, there's, there's, gra there's gravity, there's, um, there's, there's laws in this world. Like you can't just exist and have no back. It is organized world. Like there is a situation where you have to lock your door if you don't want 
a robbery in your house. I mean, you got to lock the door. So there is an organized system in the world that we live in, and we all follow some kind of organized system. If you're working, there's a certain pattern that will guide you towards success. And we look for those books, right? We look for the guidance of how we can be successful in our business. Everyone does that. So there is a sense of organized in our lives and we look for that. We, uh, and it's, it's really logic, okay? How to deal with and what's the best process to being successful in any area of life. And that's exactly what Judaism does. Whether it's in terms of monetary uh, issues, whether it's in terms of growing a family, raising kids, whether it's having a healthy marriage, whether it's the way I'm thinking about myself, about the people around me, whether it's the sense of purpose by bringing God into your life, right? All these values that we stand for are literally a, 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 a logic of how to live life more. That's what Torah means. It's a guidance to the way you live life in the world. I, I, you know, it's, it's just a word that's thrown can't let these words just get thrown out without any depth to it. It literally means I don't like things which have no logic. I promise you, I've never, never in, in the history, right, have I ever seen a rabbi walk around with his Talmud and beat someone and said, like, you should be following Talmud. You know, you're going to hell, Talmud. It doesn't work like that. We actually work a lot with logic. Judaism's not like that. We don't go knocking on people's doors. We are, we are a people of logic and intellect. And the things that we say are really an organized structure that gets us to the most success in, not guaranteed success, but it's a structure that works and gets me to a place that will succeed. That's how it works. So that's what the mitzvot are. That's what the Torah is. It's things with logic. If you want a world with chaos and no logic, then, don't, then go for that. But don't tell me you're in a place where there's no organized at all in your system, in your world, because you do live in a world which is organized too. Your mom told you not to put your hand in electricity. That's organized. Your dad also told you certain values. Don't steal and don't do certain things. That's organized. We all live in an organized fashion. You, were, you went to school for 20 years and you were taught how you're going to make a successful business. Well, that's organized. It's just a word that has no depth to it. So that's my thought on um, that. Okay, by the way, what's a rabbi? Does anyone know what a rabbi really means? Does anyone know what a rabbi means? A teacher. A teacher? A teacher? Yeah, that's what a, rab, that's what a rab is. Do you know that? A, a female? Rabbi, is it? Yes. R rabbi, actually, I had a discussion with somebody about this. Yes. And they were like, oh, the reason I don't like religion is because there's a motive between like rabbi is trying to get you more religious and i was like the i guess the difference between a rabbi and a teacher is there's a motive whereas a teacher there's not, not necessarily a motive behind it they're just trying to teach you um which i don't think there's anything wrong with it i think you know there's of course there's a motive it's religion you guys it's like a sense of purpose right if you have a sense so of purpose there is like someone told me in your books in jewish book he told me i don't like once someone told me i don't like chabad so I said, why? The most beautiful people, all they do is kindness and goodness. If there was Jews on the, if there was people on the moon, there will be a Chabad there. What's wrong with you? Why do you not like Chabad? It's the most nicest people in the world. I don't like Chabad. Why? Because the, when they ask me to put on tefillin, they're doing it because they believe that they're getting credit by putting on tefillin as well. Meaning, they, like you're saying, they get a motive. What do you mean by they're getting a motive? And he really kind of defined it to me in a better way. Okay? He said to me, because it's part of their belief to do it. It's different than being a teacher yeah. where it's not part of your belief. It's just you want to teach. But it's part of his yeah. belief to do it. So by the Chabad rabbi, it's his mitzvah because of the rabbi or whatever it was that said, you, you're going to get good ticks in your books in the heaven when you ask another Jew to put on tefillin. So you're not really doing it for the Jew that wants to put on tefillin. You're doing it for yourself. Okay? So... My response to that was that there is a motive, but it doesn't stop the reality of him caring about you. For instance, I'm, it's literally it's like saying, it's li I told him this, it's literally like saying, 
I don't want to do business with Jonathan Sadian. My name's Jack Minnell. I don't want to do business with, deal with Jonathan Sadian. He's going to sell me this product. I don't want to do it with him because I'm going to give him, he's going to make a million dollars profit. I know I'm going to make $2 million profit because I have someone who's going to buy it from me. But I know that Jonathan Sadian is going to make a million dollars profit from, from me buying his product. So I'm not going to buy the product from him. What an idiot. I'm going to make $2 million profit. Right? Jonathan Sadian came up with the best, newest uh, or, organic sanitizer that no one else has made. And it's going to do really well in business. I already have buyers in Costco, all around. All the companies are going to buy it from me. I'm, I'm guaranteed immediately $2 million success. But if I buy it from Jonathan Sadian, there's people like that, by the way. I'm, if I buy it from Jonathan Sadian, I'm not going to do it because he's going to make a million dollars as well. Right. I have a problem right. with you making... That's literally what the guy's saying. I don't like the fact that the rabbi has an agenda when he tries to get me to put on tefillin or do something mit like a mitzvah. Because in his books, he gets a credit. Why does that bother you? He gets credit and you get credit. He, he still believes you get credit. So it's like literally like him saying, you get a million dollars and he gets a million dollars. Why does that bother you? Right. It's a... It's, uh, the, pro the fault is in the person that's, that's getting upset that the other person's got is, is gaining. Why are you getting upset that the other person's gaining? You're also gaining. Uh -huh. So that's really the response that I have to that question. Well, I think maybe, maybe the disconnect comes from the fact that the person who isn't religious might not believe that there's like karma from Hashem or like, you know, favor of Hashem given for putting on to film. Maybe if that person believed that they would already be putting on to film themselves. So Good. like if they okay. don't believe that that's if they don't believe that that's the case then it's like oh he doesn't believe doing no it because like you know well Jonathan the guy that's not religious doesn't believe in the film and thinks it's a joke right he thinks it's right. it's just a joke. So but for he's, him he might not be getting I understand. he might not think that he's getting a million dollars. You see, like in your in your example, you're saying like he's, no, he's going to get a million dollars. No, but that's not, not what's bothering him. You have to understand, Jonathan. That's not what was bothering him. What was right. bothering him is that the rabbi has an agenda. That's mm -hmm. what was bothering him. It wasn't that the it was bothering him that the rabbi is making me put on tefillin, which I don't like anyway, or wants me to do something which I don't mm -hmm. believe in anyway. What bothered him was that the rabbi has an agenda, and the agenda yeah. is that. He's going to get rewarded for getting you to put on tefillin, and that's why he's doing it, not because he cares about you. Well, why do you care? Mm -hmm. Let's say that's true. Why do you? That wasn't the problem of that person. If that was the problem, fine. Just walk away and don't do it. But that, his problem was, no, I don't like the rabbi that teaches me because he has an agenda. Anyone who teaches believes in what they teach, normally, at least if he's logical and has a brain, right? If you teach, you believe in what you're teaching. You, you don't put your efforts and energy in something that you don't believe in in yourself. That's, that's, that's very dangerous. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's just the general. It won't last. You know, when a teacher's in a school and, and the values of the school is completely against his own values, he, his teaching, it, he can be there for a year, two years because of the income, but eventually it's just not going to last. He'll leave. That job will not last. So when a rabbi is teaching Judaism, it's because he likes Judaism as well and he believes that those things are good. When, when we, me and Shira taught the effective dating, which are completely from the values of the Torah, every word for word, word for word of what we taught in the effective dating series is from the Torah, starting with the story of Adam and Eve. Okay, so when we teach that, are we teaching it because we believe we're getting rewarded for it? Yes. Do we believe that people are going to have an easier, more successful dating life because of it? Yes. Great. Win-win. That's literally why we're doing it. Are we getting paid millions for doing this? No. Absolutely not, right? But that's what, that's what we're doing because we believe in it. In fact, that's the craziness. The rabbi is getting a tiny income. These people are very intellectual. A lot of the rabbis I know are extremely intelligent. If they will put their energy into some kind of business, they will be doing very well. Very intelligent people. And yet they put all their energy into something like this. Why? It's actually the exact opposite. It's the biggest proof that there's no agenda. It's because he's... He cares, he does it out of his own good and his goodwill and because he cares. If he was making billions of dollars, then I can question it. But that's not the case. That's another thing to think about. 
Okay. Here's another statement they threw at me. Is it okay to have dual loyalties? We all know what uh, Congresswoman, uh, what's her name, Ilan Omar, has said in the past that the Jews or, or the, the lobbyists for APAC or whatever it is, whatever it was, I don't know the exact language, have dual loyalties. And this has caused many Jews to be embarrassed to stand up for Israel or to show that they like Israel. They're very quiet about it because it's, maybe it's political or they, they don't want to show it uh, publicly anymore or they don't want to show their interest in Israel because it shows that I have dual loyalty. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Can I not be, f I'm English, can I not care about America and England at the same time? I have triple loyalty, Israel, uh, America and England. England's where my family is. I grew up and I have gratitude for that. America's that where order. I live now and where all the Jews live. And, and Israel as well, because I'm Jewish and I've been praying for Israel since I was born. So um, even before I was born, I was born on Sukkot whilst my mom was coming out of the synagogue. So I was praying even before I was born. So here goes, here goes the first point. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's a problem. If you have, a, if you have one loyalty to another country which is completely not within your country that you're living in. That's a problem. But Judaism is not like that. We believe in Hakarat Atov, in having gratitude. It, even in the most religious communities, do you know that on July 4th, they hang the, is the American flag? That's what we used to do. Now it's controversial to hang it. You can't, you can't even hang an American flag. Jews are lost now completely. Can't hang an American flag, can't hang an Israeli flag. It just, can't be anything. But what's what in, in, in many yeshivas in, in America, religious communities, they'd hang a big American flag on July 4th. You know why? Because they have gratitude. I tell you when somebody doesn't have a loyalty to a country is when they don't have gratitude. Having, an, having multiple loyalties doesn't mean that you don't care for where you live. That doesn't mean... It's like saying, I have... I have I have four kids, so now I, I don't have the same love for my first kid. When I had only one kid, I had love to one. Now that I have four kids, I lost my love for the first, and it has to be, what do you think? Love is something physical that goes in a box? Love is not physical. It's a spiritual thing. It doesn't have a, So a loyalty doesn't mean that you are limited to one place. It just means... A, I, I, the only place that's a problem to me is a lack of gratitude. If you're living in a place that you're not grateful for, then that's a problem to me. But if you have a loyalty to Israel and America, what's wrong with that? It's a joke. It's, the fact that it was mentioned is the biggest joke on, on earth. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with having a dual loyalty. It's, it's fascinating. It's wrong if you have one loyalty to whatever it is that you have, which is not in the place that you live in. A lack of gratitude for the place you live in. You hate the place you live in. And you only have a loyalty to another place. That's, that will be wrong because it's a real sense of a lack of gratitude. What are you living here for? But Jews are allowed to have dual loyalty. So if anyone ever says to you, oh, you have dual loyalties, say, what's wrong with that? That's a beautiful thing. Cannot love two children? What do you think? Agree or not agree? Or maybe I'm, I didn't get it. Maybe I didn't get the message. It sounds so obvious that maybe I'm missing something when someone says this statement. Am I missing something? I don't know. I think what you, what you said is <clears throat> really good. And I think that it is true that, you know, you can very rightly believe in and love uh, more than one country. I think that the accusation when someone levels it um, is more centered around, I guess, like, like you, you're loyal to Israel above America. Like you would do what was right for Israel, even if it was to the detriment of America, because you hold Israel higher than America. Like you're an American, but you consider yourself like a Jew before you consider yourself an American. And therefore you're loyal to Israel. If there was... If there was a war and both countries were, you know, facing existential threat, like you would go in the IDF before the U.S. Army. So like what's there's kind of like that, a, Jonathan. Didn't say there was. I'm saying that that's what the accusation. That's the statement that they're saying. From. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, my response to that would be, that's absolutely true. I would join the IDF over the American army any day. And my loyalty is with Israel and it always has been. So I personally don't know what's wrong with that. I never knew what was wrong with it, which is why. But I, I totally agree with you. I think in the past 20 years, we've become less, we've lost gratitude towards the things that we have here in the United States. I think particularly like the United States and maybe some other countries, I think because like you stated before, like we're, we're just living such comfortable lives, you know, things are just handed to us every day. We have technology yeah. in our fingertips, you know, food is like delivered to our door. We have Uber, we have all these things in our fingertips. And I think that we have lost kind of touch of that survival instinct. So we care less about things, right? Like we're not, we don't have enough gratitude for being having freedom right 40 50 years ago you, you would be persecuted you would die like being of a different skin color i guess my point my question to you is like if we don't have gratitude for where we live and what we have what do we have gratitude for now is there anything that people are like what are they what do they hold more important than than what they have now in the U united states in your opinion um they the truth is that when when gratitude is removed, then uh, there's a big hole that's filled. And that's jealousy, that's hate. Something is filled inside there. Okay? When you remove something, something else has to be filled. There's never, our body, our soul can never be empty. It has to fill itself with something. And what happens is when there's a lack of gratitude, so we think of all what we don't have. There's a hole called a lack of happiness. There's depression. There's sadness. We are taking, we are depressed in America today more than ever. So people tell me, oh, well, today we get diagnosed more, so that's why. Well, I don't care what it is. The reality is one in three people are depressed, and that's the reality. I, I don't care. And by the way, it's not true. I know of, I know of psychologists that went to live in the poorest of countries to kind of learn about psychology, I was reading about this, went to live in Africa, in, the, in, in, in these real broken down towns, right? These, um, what, what's the word for it? The, um, the shanty, shanty towns, right? They, they went there, lived there for a while, and they actually felt happy. They help, felt happy because they realized what they have. So um, I believe that there's a, whenever there's a lack of gratitude, there's a huge void that's filled and it's jealousy, anger, hate, um, a, a demand that everyone should give you, um, uh, just unhappiness with anyone else's success. These are all things that filled in as soon as all those voids are taken away from you uh, of gratitude. Gratitude is a key to our success, especially as Jews. That's, that's one of the main values we teach. Passover, you took us out of Egypt, and Shavuot, and Torah, thanking Hashem, brachot, blessings. Everything we do is about gratitude. So it, it's such an important value within us. It's really the key to our own success and survival. And once you take that away, you've taken away our humanity. It really is. That void is filled and it's just, it's, it's anger. You know, you're fighting over st of stupidity. You think you're fighting for something which is valuable, but it's not. And it's, it's dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. So you, to answer your question, it's filled with something, but it's very dangerous. It's filled with anger and hate and danger and pain and confusion. That's really the answer. Nothing else. So that's why we do. Judaism actually believes that you should be grateful for this country and for the country you came from and the people. Most of the Jews live in, in Israel. So I'm very, I'm very thankful for them. I'm thankful for that identity it gives me as a Jew. Hey, Rabbi, I have a comment hey, on that. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting, though, how you, how you, got, how you were talking about like dual loyalty. Uh, kind of going off the point of like, you know, sometimes people feel like uh, not, not grateful. So like, you know, I feel like nowadays, like especially with technology, everything is kind of on the fly. People are kind of like, you know, you, you don't feel grateful about like all these 
kind of little aspects of like, you know, let's say Uber, everything is on demand, things like that. And exactly. You just go to these poor countries and then it's like you kind of all of a sudden you feel more grateful that you are in, in America more than you feel like, in, like uh, in Israel as well. And I feel like a lot of the like the like a lot of the uh, depression and things like that comes from the fact that like, yeah, I would I would probably want to be serving in Israel more than I would want to be serving in like that uh, in the IDF more than I want to be serving in 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 America is because in America you feel kind of more protected. There's not so many allies against you. Like you don't feel it. While in Israel, I feel like a lot of these things have to do with like you're like it, it's always been a battle, and like you feel it within you know people in the citizenships and stuff like that you like you're amongst soldiers so you feel more appreciated right being part of connected to israel makes you feel um that you know you're 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 appreciative of israel um you're appreciative of the, what they do for you you're appreciative of your people and also you know that you're fighting a battle that's uh, really necessary in terms of you know, what the people have gone through and what they've um, done and what they need and how they've always been threatened. And it's the same threat that we've been through and we go through. So it's part of me. It's, it's a big part of our identity, honestly. And that's why there's, a, there's this mm -hmm. strong bond that young American Jews have to Israel. Not all, but a lot of them do. But yeah, I mean, even outside... what. It's, there's nothing wrong with having a gratitude to both and there's nothing wrong with being grateful to both. And to me, that's enough to tell me that I'm loyal to both and that's okay. Okay, so maybe we'll, fit, we'll do one more question. I have so many that people have asked me, it's insane. You know what? Here's, here's a good question because, because it's carrying on in the sense of gratitude. So here's the last question I'm going to ask. Uh, uh, share with you today somebody told me this uh, last week he said listen rabbi I feel I'm very jealous I'm mean, jealous of everyone when I see the success of others it bothers me I'm always angry with inside of me when I see good in others or the world I, I, I downplay it I'm jealous of people that date I'm jealous of people that, are, that have families I'm jealous of people that do well in business I'm just so angry all the time and jealous of everyone else what should I do? I don't feel like I'm connecting well with my Judaism. So that was a question that I was asked. And I think it was actually a very honest and sincere question. I don't know if many people would be so true to express their inner self like that. But this person was. And he asked me that question. So here's the question for you. What would you say? If you were the rabbi, you play the rabbi, what would you do? Somebody asked you and told you such a statement. How would you overcome uh, it? But I'd first say, well, it's a, it's a natural, natural inclination to, you know, get jealous. It's something that takes a lot of work. Um, good. That's a good response because it means you're acknowledging his challenge. You're not just denying mm -hmm. his challenge. You're acknowledging um, his challenge, which is very important. Yeah, and also making the person feel like they're not crazy. Right. Um, very good. Which is, yeah. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, you're the rabbi, but I would probably, uh, I'd probably, you know, give him, give him ways to, to work on it. And, you know, try to say that, you know, if you're going to, to be successful, then use it you know, to motivate you. Yeah. There's two ways that you can look at it. Exactly. You can either get competitive, like, Oh, that person's up. So I need to bring them down to my level. Or you can say that that person's going aim. up. So I need yeah. to try to get up too. Beautiful to response. You don't, exactly. I'm Rabbi, like you're probably going to say the Torah answer, but I'm sure in the Torah it says like, like you've said before, right. I feel like about, you know, Lashon Hara, bad things that, you know, it says in the Torah we shouldn't do or evil eye and all those things. But if it's, if you're talking, if you're talking to someone about someone and you're using it to make a point, then it's not necessarily Lashon Hara if you're using it to, warn somebody or make a point or etc so like use it to motivate yourself if you like is something you might say yeah you should it says that 
that the jealousy of those that are studious can increase your wisdom. Meaning the jealousy of those that are successful increases your success because it pushes you and it motivates you to also do well, like you're saying. So that's really the way you should uh, use it as a platform to your own growth. That's true. Anyone else? How would you respond? Any other responses? Um, I guess I'll, I'll add something, yeah. So I learned that each of us has, um, like, Salam Elohim, which means that we have a little pizza Hashem inside of us. So really, no matter what we do or where we are in life, we're still, we still have that holiness. And um, so, yeah, it sounds like that person is just, like, really struggling with self-esteem and doesn't really believe in themselves, but they have to realize that no matter where they are right now, they still have that spark of holiness Beautiful. that comes from Hashem. Um, and also I learned that we were all given the tools that we need to succeed in life. Um, we each have our own particular mission and we are given the tools that we need to accomplish that. However, the problem comes when we look at another person's life and we say like, oh, well, I want to be like them or I want to do this. And sometimes it just seems like other people have it so easy or that they're naturally like nice. charismatic. They're naturally, they have a sense of humor. Well, that was the Ooh. tool that they were given because they need, they need that specific tool to accomplish their mission. And if that person doesn't have that tool, well, it probably means they don't really need it to accomplish their particular mission. But they, I mean, they Beautiful. can still work on it, on their attributes and stuff. But um, I would just say, like, don't lose focus and don't give up, you know? Beautiful. Beautiful. That every person has a package, not just the good things that you see. There's an entire package that comes with that person. Good. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? How would you respond to somebody who's dealing with jealousy? You basically nailed it all. But I'll tell you some of the things that I wrote that you may not have thought of, okay? So number one is work on being happy, being happy with what you have, being more grateful and thankful for what you have. Happiness is a state of mind. So how do you achieve that? Well, Judaism has many ways of achieving being happy with the things you have, the food you have. What's jealousy? You're always thinking that if I have what's out there, then I'll be happy. If I have something else, then I'll be happy. If I have this new shirt, then I'll be happy. If I have this new bike, I'll be happy. If I have this new car, I'll be happy, right? So then what's controlling me? All of those things are controlling me. So happiness is really a state of mind. How do you achieve that? By working on being thankful with what you already have. And what is that? Brachot, we do prayers. Before you drink, think about the water that you're drinking. After you go to the bathroom, think about the fact that you went to the bathroom. A guarantee to work, to, to, because I want to give tools. I want to give real tools for this person to overcome that challenge. It's true that I could just say, just look at what he's doing. Just, you know, be happy. But I want to give real practical tools that will help that person from today, right now. He'll go home and he'll have those tools. And tool number one is brachot, making blessings, thinking about when you come out of the bathroom, meditating on the fact that it works, meditating on the fact that you can actually eat on your drink, on your food, on your fruits, on everything that you do when you get a new suit. Do you know we're meant to make a bracha on that called shechianu, right? We're meant to actually make a shechianu on a new suit. So if you actively make a bracha, a blessing on the things that you do and you get constantly, you focus on them, you will be guaranteed to be a happier person and a less jealous person. Okay, so that's number one. That was a practical tool, number one. Practical tool number two is bless the people that are successful in, as opposed to cursing them out, like Jonathan and Joseph were saying, but actively do it. Say to yourself, wow, he just got engaged. I'm so jealous. Deep down, you're jealous. But you say to yourself, I really hope they succeed. Just say it out loud with words, with your mouth. Say, I bless them that they're successful in their marriage. Oh, you just got a new home? I really bless you that your home should be used in beautiful ways and you should only have good things in your home and you should only have blessings. Actively bless the people that are successful that you're jealous of. 
It's a great tool that will transform your jealousy into a positive energy right now. So just actively bless them out instead of cursing them out. Oh, my friend that I hate had a car. I bless him that he's successful. Force yourself. Even you don't Wait, believe. Rabbi, you're always blessing me. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. But um, <laughs> number three is, um, like you guys said, and this is actually directly in the Torah. It says, don't be jealous of your friend's wife. Don't be jealous of his car. Don't be jealous of his home. It doesn't say literally car, right? His donkey. But that's his car back in the day. Don't be jealous of his home. Don't be jealous of his workers. It says servant. But it's not really a servant in the way you think. But it says don't be jealous of his workers. Don't be jealous of his business. And don't be jealous of everything your friend has. What's the point of saying all of that? Redundancy. Dun, 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 right? He said, don't be jealous of your friend's wife. Don't be jealous of his car. Don't be jealous of his business. And don't be jealous of everything he has. Dude, can you not just tell me, don't be jealous of everything he has? Why do you have to list it off and then tell me again, don't be jealous of everything he has? Says our rabbis explain that that's the way to overcome jealousy. The way to overcome jealousy is don't be jealous of just his car. Don't be jealous of just the look. Don't be jealous of just his house. Don't be jealous of just his... Be jealous of his entire lifestyle. His entire life. Find out about his sickness that he went through. Find out about all his problems. Don't just look at his Facebook likes and all the good things on Facebook. Look at all his problems. Look at his entire package. And the Torah is basically saying the, the cure to jealousy. Look at the entire package. What's the entire package? A package that you will never want. The... T the the, the, the idea would be, take everybody's life, put it in a box, okay? Everybody here, put everybody's life in a box on a table and wrap it nicely and say, this is Joseph Cohen's life. And when you open the box, you see all of his problems and you see all of his successes and all of his challenges and all of his everything. And then you go into another box, you see Jack Mills and you see all of his brilliant life that it seems to, that he has and then you see all of his challenges and all of his problems and all of his upbringing and all of his and you and he close it eventually you'll go back to your own box and you say thank you very much i'm done with all these boxes i want my own i'm done i'm not doing any of that stuff i want my own so the antidote to jealousy is to think to yourself i don't see the whole package think about the entire package in the other person and the best package for you is you that's the response of the Torah, directly in the Torah. And the fourth thing I would say to that person is study Torah. And I don't necessarily mean opening the Bible and reading it in Hebrew because most people here don't speak the language. So what I, I would suggest, though, is go on to simpletoremember.com. Simpletoremember.com. It's a .com that's really simple to remember. It's called simpletoremember.com. And it has some amazing lectures that you can listen to. And you can go onto something called YouTube, which is also simple to remember, but not .com. And if you go on there, you can find tons of great rabbis like Rabbi Sachs and, and some amazing Aish rabbis that you could listen to and enjoy. And by doing that, you add meaning to your life. You add purpose, a sense of um, satisfaction. Not that you're just going through the day and living, but you're actually finding wisdom in your life. And when you do that, and it's, it's a given. You will reduce the level of jealousy because you feel, ah, I know about marriage. I know. You just get the answers to everything just by constantly listening. What is happiness? What's jealousy? How do I... If you constantly listen to all of these lectures, you will eventually, like, like now, like everyone now is listening to this talk, I believe that by doing this, you reduce your jealousy immediately. Because when you strengthen your knowledge, your wisdom, you just strengthen your inner self, your core. Right now, we feed, right? You can see Jonathan's eating his cholent right now. So he's feeding his stomach. And you know what? He's also feeding his soul by listening to Torah. So you feed your stomach, you feed your soul. That's the way to do it. You can't just feed your physical stomach. You've got to feed your soul as well. And if somebody doesn't feed the soul, then they're going to complain about their jealousy issues. That's just how it is. Because materialism is your number one. So how come he's got more materialistic, better life than me? I can't handle it. 
How come she's got a better materialistic life? I can't understand because my number one is materialism. But the minute you add spirituality to your life and you listen to MP3s as you're doing your work or you, you do as you're driving, you listen to something meaningful as opposed to another political story, you will gain much more in terms of being happy from within and not looking for jealousy. The study of Torah is connected kulam, it says. It's the strongest, the strongest tool, cure out there. It's the best. And I believe it really does work. So that's my uh, response to the guy. And I think uh, he went home pretty happy or home on his phone, put it down and carried on with his life. So that was my response. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Maybe next week we'll continue with some more questions.